two weeks ago was one of the most violent periods of time, seven day periods of time in the recent history in America. The uh, Saturday's massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh area left 11 dead and six more wounded. On Friday of that week, a student was shot and killed at Butler High School in Matthew, North Carolina. Now that one didn't hit most of the newspapers because there were so many other horrible things happening in the world. Uh, matter of fact, on that same week, seven people were shot and wounded during a Halloween party at a Southern California nightclub. And they arrested the suspected pipe bomber, the, the man who allegedly sent packages to President Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, CNN, and other thought and political leaders in the country. On Wednesday of that week, a man who tried unsuccessfully to break into a predominantly African-American church in Kentucky left that church and went to Kroger's where he saw two African-American folks and he killed them just because of the color of their skin. All of these events added to the acts of violence that we have experienced here in our state and the things that we have been confronted with here in Colorado have caused most places of worship to get even more serious about providing security. And we are, have done that and are doing that. But that is only one step. And honestly, it's not the most important step. There are two things that we, as followers of Jesus, must do that are more important than providing for our own safety. The first is pray. We must be a people of prayer. When Jesus talked about the temple, he reminded the, the leaders in, in, of Israel, as we've been through our study in Mark, he reminded them that his, the temple was supposed to be a house of prayer. Now, we don't come together to worship in a house of prayer. That'll sound kind of strange, right? Where's the house of prayer right now? So, remember, God came, met with Adam and Eve. He had intimate communion with them. But they sinned and put a barrier between themselves and God called sin. And from that point on, God would work in different individuals. He worked in people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he led his people to build a, a movable worship experience. Tabernacle. That's where he met with his people in the Holy of Holies. And then from there, he moved to the, the stationary place of worship, the temple. But only the high priest... And only once a year was he allowed to go into the Holy of Holies and meet with God. Well, when Jesus died, what we just celebrated, that veil that separated all of mankind except for the high priest once a year was torn in two, ripped from the top to the bottom, showing that we all have open access to God. And Paul later tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 and 3 that we are the temple of God. So where is the house of worship of, of prayer now? In us. Okay, let, let me try that again. Where is the house of prayer now? Okay, let's, let's make it more personal. Let's say me. Where is the house of prayer now? Let me ask you, are you praying? When you see these things, do you wring your hands in fear or do you pray? There's a difference. We can be afraid or we can take that fear and replace it with trust and we can say, God, how do you want me to participate in being light and salt in this world? What do you want me to do? 
We need to be praying for the families who've been impacted. We need to be praying for the communities that have been impacted. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. If people in national positions of authority are making decisions you don't agree with, pray for them. And by the way, vote this week. Pray. We don't need to be afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind because we trust him. Because he is the one that we can lean on. He's the one we can run to. Pray for God to bring revival and healing in our land. Pray that God will work. This morning I got a text from um, Terry McLagan. If you're on our prayer uh, team and you get our, our prayer requests in the, uh, via email throughout the week, you've been following the saga of Vaughn McLagan. Ma Vaughn McLagan is a six foot three, 250 pound mountain of a man from South Africa. He's been in the military. He's just, there's not a thing this guy can't do. But every single one of us is fragile. And he experienced that at 12,000 feet when he had a heart attack. And they brought him down, and I won't regale you with all the details, but this was Terry's um, update this morning. Thanking God for prayer warriors and answered prayers and for the in intercessions and mercies of my Lord and Savior. My husband is a walking miracle, having brushed against death in a minimum of four times in the past five weeks. He will be able to walk out of the hospital today and on to rehabilitation as he fights to conquer the lingering effects of his tribulations. Christ has been by his side every step of the way. Glory to God. God, is, God was by Vaughn's side every step of the way. I don't know if I told you, but at one point when Vaughn was trapped in delirium, I was sitting by his side crying and holding his hand. Vaughn lifted his head and looked at me and said, It'll be all right. Then he closed his eyes and went right back to sleep. Prayer works. I'm not sure why prayer is an uncomfortable thing for us to be involved with. Maybe it helps just to think, what is, what is prayer? Prayer is just simply talking to God. So what I'd like to do just for a few moments is I'd like for us to pray. This is not a house of prayer, but today it's going to be a room of prayer. You are the house of prayer. I'm the house of prayer. And so I just want to, right where you're at, you can stand if you want. You can just sit where, where you are. You can, but, but would I, could I get three or four people to just lead us in prayer for our nation? Lead us in prayer for the things that you're aware of that are happening, for the things that are on your heart, the things that are concerning to you. We won't take long. We'll just take a couple of minutes to do this. So if you are interested in doing this, then um, everyone, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Somebody lead us out.
Amen. Amen. Father, I pray that you would bring revival to each of our hearts. Light the fire, light the flame of your spirit. Give us a desire to give ourselves wholly to you, anew and afresh today. Work in each of our lives, Lord. Don't allow us to to be asleep at the wheel, uh, to be lazy, to be complacent, to allow ourselves to stay in a comfortable place Speak to us, God, today. Help us to do what you call us to do as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So I said there's two other things. The first is pray. The second is be disciples of Jesus. Be disciples. I mean, we, we say at First Baptist Church, we, we want God to make us a force for good in Golden and Beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Nothing happens unless we begin by being disciples, and that means that we're serious about following after him. Paul reminded us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our faith calls us to engage in this battle fearlessly wielding Jesus' weapons of choice, love, grace, mercy, even joy. All of it empowered by the Spirit of God. All of it empowered in prayer or energized in prayer. Now, as we come to Mark chapter 14, the battle that we've just been talking about gets very real for Jesus and his right-hand man, Peter. Turn to Mark chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 53. You'll be on page 710 if you're following along in a pew Bible. By the way, if you don't happen to have a, um, a Bible of your own, we would love for you to take that pew Bible as, your, as, your, as our gift to you. Now, um, Jesus at this point has been betrayed, he's been arrested, he's been abandoned, he's in the clutches of the religious leaders who have already decided that he must die. Verse 53, they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Let me just stop for one second. Remember, when Jesus called the disciples in the first part of, of the Gospel of Mark, he called them, first of all, to be with him. Peter was not with him. Peter was following at a distance. When tough times come, sometimes our first reaction is to preserve ourselves, is to think about me, to run away from the fire. We're going to see today that Jesus ran toward the fire and Peter basked in the glow of a different fire. And I think that God is going to challenge each of us to consider where we are at 
As we began going through the gospel of our study in the gospel of Mark, we, we began saying, you know, this is what it means to be a disciple. And this is where the rubber meets the road, literally, to where, where we have to say, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever he wants me to do, whatever it costs. And you have a guy like Peter, who's big, strapping, successful business guy. And when the tough, tough times came, he was not where he should have been. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many, many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree, and some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple and um, that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no, test, no answer to make? What is this that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Instead of being bothered by what they said, Jesus maintained his silence. He didn't say anything. Jesus endured two trials. The first was religious. The second we'll look at next week is, is a civil trial. Now, we have an idea that, you know, generally religion makes people better people. So aren't religious people, aren't they generally good? And don't they really want good things? Well, not in this case. These guys wanted Jesus to suffer. In, in John chapter 18, we read this. Pilate said to them, talking to the religious leaders, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. It's not lawful for us to put anyone to death. These folks weren't playing. They were tired of Jesus. Under the law, they could have stoned him. Leviticus 24.14 says that's what you do when somebody blasphemes. But stoning wasn't good enough for him. He needed to be dispatched with, all, with no prejudice. He needed to be gotten rid of. Roman crucifixion was the only solution that they would settle for. But let me point out something. We've seen this already several times in Mark. God is able to take even the hatred of these men who are supposed to stand for him and use it to accomplish his purposes. And what was God's purpose that he would accomplish through this? He wanted to bring light into the darkness. He wanted to bring life to the dead. He wanted to bring healing to the broken. He didn't just come so we could break bread and, and drink juice. He came to make dead people live. He came to change everything. And the cross was essential to his plan. So in Galatians, Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hang, who's hanged on a tree. Now this religious trial was unscheduled, unofficial, and illegitimate. The Jews had a law that required that any official meeting of the Sanhedrin was to take place during the day. But they were willing to forego that law when they set up for themselves because the Romans only did their civil court proceedings before dawn so that they could get people out to the cross as quickly as possible. And so the Jews walked away from their own law and said, no, we want to do what we want to do. They didn't care about right and wrong. They didn't care about what God wanted. They simply wanted to make sure that Jesus died because when murder fills your heart, there is no room for God. The Sanhedrin had another law that did not allow them to pass sentence on someone for a capital crime like this on the same day. They had to wait until the next day. 
Well, they weren't going to let a little thing like a law like that stand in their way. They pushed on through. This Jewish Supreme Court was riding a crest of growing law, a growing wave of lawlessness. They didn't care about anything but making sure that Jesus was gone. God's law, a self-imposed rule of order, would not keep them from executing Jesus. Now, up to this time, Jesus had, had made different statements that helped them know that he knew he was Messiah. But he didn't, in a formal setting like this, come right out and say it. Now, the, the, the Jewish rulers got to the place, or the, the, the high priest himself got to the place where he, he put Jesus on the spot, and he asked him under oath to answer a question. Now, Jesus didn't do this because he put him in a spot. He didn't do it because he tricked him or trapped him. All the way throughout the Gospels, we read that Jesus doesn't do anything before his time. Finally, the time had come. He had done everything that he needed to do. He accomplished all he needed to accomplish, except for the final and the most important thing that he would do, die on our behalf. So we look back into verse 60, uh, second part of 61. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus is the Son of Man seen by Daniel who will ride the clouds of heaven. He will judge every person, every language, every tongue, every nation, and he will rule over a kingdom that will never end. This is the way Daniel said it. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came out like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall never be destroyed. Then John says in Revelation 1, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Jesus will sit in judgment of this kangaroo court. And after Jesus pronounced this to them, instead of his, his, the full revelation of his divine identity causing them to repent, to fall to their knees and plead for forgiveness. They sprung their trap. Verse 63. The high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him to cover his face and strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. Jesus willingly admitted who he was. When to deny it would, might have meant that he could have gone free. But Jesus had come, the only person ever born for the express purpose of dying for the sins of the world. Jesus willingly denied himself and would eventually take up his cross. He accepted complete rejection, total humiliation, excruciating pain, and death. Keep that thought in your mind. Because while Jesus was enduring his trials, Peter was experiencing a trial of his own. You see, Peter's the one who rebuked Jesus. He told Jesus, no way are you going to die. No way, I'll die in your place. There's no way that's going to happen. Well, Jesus then began to let Peter know that really there's going to be a trial going on, Peter, but buddy, I, I don't want you to focus on me. I want you to focus on yourself because you're going to be undergoing a trial that is going to be nearly impossible for you to handle. This is the way Jesus said it to him. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. 
Simon, Satan has asked my father to have you because he wants to sift you like wheat. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. It's something that we know is not true. Look what happened to Jesus, and look what happened to Peter. God will bring tests and trials into our lives for a reason. One reason is always to make our faith stronger, to, to give us an opportunity to lean hard into him. Peter did not get it. He continued to deny. But here's the thing we all need to understand, that every single one of us is in the, the, the crosshairs of the enemy. He wants to destroy us. Satan wanted to rip Peter apart, tearing him limb from limb, leaving him a hollow shell of spiritual, emotional, and physical debris. The enemy has always and only three purposes. Jesus tells us that he comes only to do three things, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to steal your heart from God. And when he's got your heart in his realm... He wants you to live for him, but guess what? Even if you give your life in service to him, guess what he's going to do? He is going to kill you. Because his end game for every human being is destruction. That's who he is. That's what he does. Jesus was accused three times. Peter was also accused three times. While Jesus was under fire inside, Peter sat by the fire outside warming himself against the frigid pre-dawn frost. When a young servant girl caught a glimpse of his troubled face as the flames flickered and the light shone on it, and what she said sent chills down Peter's spine. <clears throat> you were also with the Nazarene, we read in verse 67. You were also with him. You're, you're one of his guys. Now, Peter's the one who had boasted that if everyone else fell away, everyone else ran away, I would stay with you. But when it came right down to it, Peter melted. Now, every single one of us thinks right now in the safety and security of this room, safety and security of our homes, that if I was to be accused and confronted for my faith, I would stand strong. And we all hope that we would. But I would say that we should take the response of the big fishermen to heart as we consider where we're at. Because this guy was someone that, that really, of all the disciples, I would have thought would have stand, stood with Jesus. But he is a solemn reminder to not rely on our flesh to not rely on ourselves because what does he do? Verse 68 I neither know nor understand what you mean I, I don't know what you're talking about well the girl wasn't quite done yet she um, came a second time and she said it louder this time I, I, I suspect and she said you know no I, I think you are one of his followers her loose lips were about to sink Peter's ship. When she said that in verse 69, well, again, Peter denied her accusation. But the big man's Galilean accent gave him away. He's accused a third time, but this time by the crowd. Look at verse, um, verse 70. Again, he denied it, and after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Now, now he knew he needed to do something. Just to deny wasn't enough. Peter had to, to, uh, to stop this wave, this mob mentality that was beginning to grow. And so it says in verse 71, that he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Now, there's no object for this curse. The ESV, which I just read from, and the NIV assume that Peter's calling this curse down on himself. 
but it just says that he began to call down a curse. I'm not sure that he called down the curse on himself. I think he was in a tight enough spot to where he wanted everyone to know that he was not lined up with Jesus at all. And so I suspect that he called down a curse on Jesus. And that he did everything he could to verbally extract himself from any idea that there would be any sort of relationship with Jesus. You see, in the early church, to, to pronounce such a curse was evidence to those who were, who were examining you that you were not a follower of Christ. Matter of fact, in, um, in uh, 160 AD, the bishop of a, of a little town called, we call it today Izmir, it's in Turkey, but in, at the time it was called Smyrna, the bishop's name was Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was standing before the Roman pro proconsul, and the Roman proconsul said to him, Swear, and I will release you. All you got to do, deny Jesus, throw a swear word at him, I'll release you. This is what Polycarp said. Eighty-six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And they, they killed him. I think it's likely that Peter cursed Jesus so the crowd would know he was disavowing any allegiance to Jesus. Under the most intense pressure, Jesus confessed his true identity. He denied himself and he signed his own death warrant. While the wisp of a word, the weight of a feather caused Peter to collapse and lie to save his own hide. When the pressure was on, Jesus denied himself while Peter defended himself. Faithfulness under trial involves self-denial without concern for self-preservation. As I began, it is obvious in our culture that violence is on the increase. Civil discord is epidemic. Racial discrimination and hate crimes are common. The pressure is on in our culture. Everyone is feeling it. Jesus is the cure, and you are the delivery system. Jesus is the answer that this world needs today, and we are the ones on whose lips that answer rests. When the heat is turned up, when someone stokes the fire under you, how do you react? When you feel at risk, your future's in question, someone accuses you, do you make excuses? Are you quick to blame someone else or do you accept responsibility? Do you hide or run away? Do you get angry, get louder, get physical? Do you shut down and push people away? Do you lie like Peter or tell the truth like Jesus? A faithful disciple lives a life of self-denial for the cause of Christ without concern for self-preservation. So what does it look like for me to live a life of self-denial? What does it look like for me to be a faithful disciple? What does it look like for me to live the way Jesus did, to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him? I think there are three things that fly out of this passage. The first is, be a faithful disciple. Be a faithful disciple. To be a, a disciple means you're following. And so to be a faithful disciple means that I'm following faithfully the way Jesus lived and the example Jesus set. So Jesus denied himself. He did not defend himself. Romans 13, 12 says it this way. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. 
Everything around us makes provision for the flesh. It is difficult to make sure that we have time in God's word. Make sure that we have time being the house of prayer we're supposed to be. Make sure that we represent Christ well in our world. That's what he calls us to do. So the questions that that haunted me as I was thinking through this is, do others see godliness in, in me? Do they see godliness in you? Have I gotten lazy? Have I forgotten the adage, garbage in, garbage out? Am I filling my mind with, with things that aren't necessarily blatant lies, but just enough of tweaking of the truth that it draws me off center in my walk with Christ? How am I investing in my own discipleship? making sure that I'm following after him. Be a faithful disciple. Second would be deny yourself for the cause of Christ. A force for good in golden and beyond, but we will only be a force for good if I am a force for good. If you are a force for good. Because this church is made up of each of us. This is our family. This is our force for good. This is what God has called us to do. You can't do everything, but each of us can do something. We all can and must do something to take the light of the gospel with us everywhere that we go. Now, we have all kinds of things that we can do within the walls of this building, and and I, I want to encourage you to consider some of those things, but I want to th- make us think outside the walls for just a few moments. Let's think about what it might look like if I were to sacrifice, deny myself, and get involved in something bigger than me. Did you know that since Roe v. Wade was passed in the 60s, that 60 million babies have been sacrificed on the altar of convenience and political expediency? Does God want you to do something about that? Did you know that there are more slaves today in the world than there were when Great Britain and the U.S. abolished slavery. And one of the areas that is the the most burgeoning area of slavery is sex trafficking. Did you know that Colorado is one of the leading states for sex trafficking in America? Does that make your blood boil? Should it? Is there something God wants you to do about that? Did you know that there are children that go to bed hungry every day of their lives? Did you realize that there are millions of people across the globe who have never even heard the name Jesus? Are you concerned about ISIS? You concerned about the threat of radical Islam? I imagine if I asked people to put their hands up, we'd probably most all of us would do that. Well, there's something you can do about that. You know what that is? Join Pastor Wagi's team. Pastor Wagi is our um, our director of Middle Eastern connections. Is the title we've given him, and basically what he's doing is helping us know how to build relationships with the Muslim community that's right across Caddy Corner from us. If you're concerned, maybe consider being involved with him. He's still raising his personal support. You could support him financially. You could pray for he and Lois. You could actually be part of his team and let him train you and you could join, link arms with him and, and help him help us reach our spiritual cousins. You see, the only thing, the only way we become a force for good is if, 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 if we are each a force for good. And I don't know what it is God is calling you to. I'm certainly not saying we need to add a ton more ministries here. I'm just saying that we need to do something. I need to do something. You need to do something. It's not about what someone else is doing. 
It's about what we must do. <clears throat> Is the rooster crowing for you today? Immediately the rooster crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. He broke down and he wept. Do you acknowledge Jesus with your lips but deny him with your life? See, I think the third thing, and this, is, this summarizes all of it, we should be a faithful disciple. We should deny ourselves to the cause of Christ. But I think if I were to summarize all of it in one statement, I would say this. Spend yourself for the cause of Christ. Spend yourself for the cause of Christ. A true brother comes to be with you in your time of need. That's what Andrew, a Sudanese disciple of Jesus, said to David Platt when he came there to serve them, to bring some gifts to them and to help in the ministry that they're in, involved in. <clears throat> then he said, David, you are a true brother. Thank you for coming to be with us. And this is how David Platt responded. Tears welled up in my eyes as the reality of the gospel hit home with me in an entirely new way. I was immediately reminded that when God chose to bring salvation to you and me, he did not send gold, he did not send silver, he did not write a check. He came himself. I was convicted for even considering that I should give money instead of actually coming to Sudan. How will I ever show the gospel to the world if all I do is send my money? Was I really so shallow as to think that my money is the answer to the needs of the world? If we're going to accomplish the global purpose of God, it will not be primarily through giving our money, as important as that is. It will happen primarily through giving ourselves. That is what the gospel represents, and it's what the gospel requires. We all will invest our lives in something. We will invest our time, we will invest our resources, our skills, our abilities, and our money. But the greatest investment I think we can make is to follow Jesus' example and spend ourselves serving others. Let's pray together. Jesus, you know what you want each of us to do. Spirit, I pray that you would do your work in us, that you'd show us, that you'd reveal to us, that you'd speak to us. We don't want to just run at, at, at a problem. We want to walk with you towards being the solution you want us to be. Speak to us, God. Work in us and work through us for your glory. Make us a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Amen.